We're getting back on track here with Catherine and Emily, but as you know, we won't stay there for long because this is the Going Off Track podcast. Hello, hello, and welcome back to the Going Off Track podcast. I'm Catherine, that's Emily, and what a summer finale was that? Love it. This is why we love spa. This is what we were saying in our prediction episode. Spa is one of the best, if not the best, uh, racetracks or circuits or whatever you want to call it of the year and it's such a great grand finale for going into the summer break yeah like you know it it completely delivered we will talk about all of the things um but yeah it was it was really really fun to watch and I cannot wait to see what we're gonna you know have the second half of the season I know and I feel like we're just really between last week and this week constructors and drivers are starting to not I don't want to say shake up but become closer Mm -hmm. to where it's not just Max and Red Bull running away with it it's definitely we have a lot more contenders it's much closer which just going into the second half of the season I'm even more excited because if Max would have won this weekend like Red Bull and him would have really I mean obviously they're in the lead they would increase their lead I'm glad that they didn't and now things are getting tighter and closer and more exciting for us. Yeah, no, he he was able to keep pace with Lando and then, you know, continue to keep pace when he inherited P4. Obviously, it is not nearly as relevant as other things that happened today. Um, but he, I, I told you that Red Bull was not going to, you know, completely come out and dominate at Spa. Um, yeah. Or at least the max side of the Red Bull garage wasn't until after the summer break. So I came, I fully expect, I, I did not expect this, but I expected Max's performance was better, which it was. And that, you know, they're not going to figure it out until after the break. Break. Yeah. I feel like a lot is going to go down over summer break. It usually does. We always use, well, I don't say usually, but generally we have a good summer break, lots of movement, lots of things going on. Things are said, things are denied, action is taken. So yeah, I mean, we had a we had a pretty mellow summer break last year, right? Um, to make up for the fact that 2022 was the silliest silly season in such a long time, which we have a whole episode breaking down what we happened. Do. Um, which if you're watching this on YouTube, it is linked up top. Um, but I think this summer break is is might just peak. Um, what happened in 2022? I don't know. I don't think you can beat the Oscar Piastri fiasco. But um, I think it might get close. That it, it might, it get, might get a little close. It might because I think yeah. we'll get five seats, maybe even six, depending on Checo. Yeah, um, I think we'll get five seats during the summer break. Yeah, I think I think we will get through the summer break with the 2025 grid set, and by set I mean set in quotes. But like for the most part, we will know where everyone should be going. Yes. you know, barring any catastrophes or ridiculousness. Um, but. Usually we we do a little bit of like news that has happened between when our last episode dropped and when um, th- this episode drops, but we need to talk about George Russell, which, which is kind of there. news, yeah. So good old George, poor we George. Not, we are not his number one fans on this podcast, not particularly. Um, but you never like to see someone, you know, get kicked. I guess he's not really down. He was very very up, and he was you know kicked quite literally off the podium. So he won the the Belgian Grand Prix snacks Until he didn't. for you, but then he didn't. So his car was found to be 1.5 kilos underweight, which is like about two and a half pounds. Um, if I'm doing my conversion right, maybe more. Don't ask me. Or a little under, but very, very small amount. Um, and because of that, he was disqualified and so that sucks like it sucks when you drive and you win and you do nothing against like nothing of your own fault or doing and it's just like the team didn't have the car at the right weight so you lose like that's I think that would be the worst like if he drove like an asshole and you know K Mag's car bombed someone and then won and he got a penalty that would be one thing but to lose it for something that's out of your truly out of your control like you never like to see that you know yeah yeah you know it and and to to bring to your point like George's race was pretty flawless he's like y'all I want to do a one-stop and I remember he, the hearing him on radio and be like 
Ooh, a one stop Georgia. You sure? But that one stop, it was it was flawless. They pitted him at the right time. They they really gave him the the good strategy, and he just he did exactly what he was supposed to do and won that race all the way up until his car was too light. Which yeah. is just it is it is really unfortunate for all that you know. He's obviously not our favorite driver. Right, but I, I wouldn't wish this on anybody. No, absolutely not. Absolutely, this is not. a horrible way to win, to lose a win, yeah. and it kind of like begs. I know we make fun of Carlos for being his like chief engineer and driver all the time over at Ferrari, but it's really interesting to see when drivers really push the strategy of like, hey, I know this is our game plan, but like, no, we need to do this, and it's. I just wonder how. I mean, in this case, you know they did the one stop like he was like hey let's look into the one stop let's maybe switch up the strategy which I think it's great that they were listening to him but I wonder how much on the off radio on like non-drivers so people on the wall are really looking at it and being like yes we're gonna take it seriously or just like George (laughs) shut up you know what I mean yeah I mean some sometimes George is like well we should be doing this and they're like slow your roll buddy (laughs) um but I I really think that clearly they were reading what he was reading and he was he saw what they wanted him to see and and clearly it all worked out yeah no it's just interesting to see like they I mean we hear them we're on plan d plan e plan f whatever like they put a ton of hours and manpower into all of these strategy plans and maybe the one stop was one of the strategy plans that they had I don't know you know it probably was I mean right exactly I would have to interesting to see like how much the strategists who are hired for strategy take into account what the drivers are relating back to them. Yeah, but I mean, these these drivers have been doing this for like so long since they were what, no, four course, years old. So, yeah. so you know, the, it's it's not just, and I'm not saying that you're saying this, but it, you know, for those who are listening, it's not just a question of you know the drivers are just told what to do. Like these drivers are, when, when we say that they're professional athletes in the sport, they are professionals. They, they know are, every yeah. inch of everything that they do. Um, they, they're so meticulous about how they learn a track and how they drive, whether it's through the sim and doing track walks and, you know, all the little diagrams and things that they do and figuring out where the racing lines are and all those things, you know, it's, it's really meticulous and the the amount of calculations and you know stuff that they have to do in their heads while driving like 150 200 miles an hour is astonishing to me yeah no it's just it's always interesting to me to like see how things play out and how they switch strategies and and we all know when they don't and when agree. it works it works because <laughs> we get that yeah. right and when it works it works and you know but that's a whole thing I feel like I mean, I don't want to say some of sometimes it's luck, but sometimes it is like you you really risk mm-hmm. it and you take a chance on a one stop versus a two stop or, you know, the timing of your pits to undercut, whatever. So there is a little bit of luck when it comes down to it at the end of the day. Yeah, no, it's sometimes it's playing into the hands of a safety car, which we really haven't seen safety car. In, we haven't. In, in, I was in just thinking that. I was just um, thinking that. But they have so many contingencies and contingencies for contingencies, um, which is why you have Ferrari radio calls are like, let's go with plan V. Um, but it, it's just, it's really, um, it, it, it's a lot of, you know, things that you have to think through. And we're just like, ooh, vroom car, go fast. That's fun. Exactly. Exactly. Well, speaking of luck. Oh, yeah. Someone really lucked out today. So originally it was a Mercedes 1-2 finish, which is great. We haven't, I don't know when, I could not tell you when the last time we saw a Mercedes 1-2 finish. It's I think it's, a, while. it's been a couple of years. I think it's yeah. only been a couple of years. It, 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 has, it hasn't been as long as it feels. Right. And then it's maybe some more, maybe it will be later this season. But since George was DQ'd, Lewis Hamilton ended up actually winning the Belgian Grand Prix. So he went from not winning a race last year to now winning two this season, which is great. I'm happy for him. Again, I think he's great for the sport. The more competitive mm-hmm. he can stay in the sport, the longer he'll be around. I know Catherine's probably not thrilled <laughs> that it's um that it's Lewis. I'm pretty sure when he, when George won, you said, well, at least it's not Lewis. That is exactly what is. I said. <laughs> And now I'm like, well, at least it's not George. Yeah. Um, but it's exciting. I mean, I I can't 
I don't know. Especially now that he's coming over to Ferrari. But I saw a meme on Instagram. Yeah, you're going to have to get used to that. And it was like Lewis running and it's like running to cancel my contract with Ferrari now that I have a winning car at Mercedes. Yeah. Um, funny how the uh, the cookie crumble is there. But it's exciting. Yes. Yeah, this is victory number 105. It's Which so is many victories. Um, this is his 201st podium. Um, and also... On this day in 2013, 11 years ago, Lewis won his first race with Mercedes, uh, which was at the time at the Hungarian Grand Prix. So, like, this is just a big day for Lewis. And if you've seen the memes surrounding them, there's, like, the the 4.4 second pit stop from Oscar Piastri. He's car number 44. The document disqualifying George Russell was document 44. Um, oh, so yeah. There have been 44s everywhere, um, which is, is kind of funny. And, it, it you know, that, that you know, co- coincidence versus causation type of thing so it's it's um it was it was it was pretty funny but like I you know I honestly like don't remember a lot of Lewis's actual drive today no um you know because so much of the drive was focused on like what was Max doing and then what was you know happening up front and obviously at the end of the race it did get really close between George and Lewis and Oscar and had there been one more lap we probably would have had a three-way fight for first um which would have been really cool but yeah I I I felt that like Lewis was just kind of there doing doing his thing running his his strategy it's the sneaky Mercedes points yeah and he did kind of say that like he he didn't really feel that he was on like George was on a flawless strategy Lewis did not feel the same way he he thought that he still had a lot of life left in his tires whenever he was brought in and you know obviously it worked out for him but he I I I think he he kind of made it clear that he wasn't entirely happy with how it how it came together um until George got DQ'd yeah I mean again putting my you know reasonable hat on i feel like lewis is never happy with how things play out regardless of if he wins he's on the podium i feel like he'll always have something that he says needs to be improved or they need to work on or something like that which again is fine because he's a high level competitive athlete always looking to improve nothing is perfect i don't think anyone's ever driven a perfect race so um yeah i don't know but sometimes he's annoying (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And sometimes he he whines about his tires being gone, and then all of a sudden he's setting purple sectors. Um, but you know, that's that's Lewis for you sometimes. And then uh, behind him in P three, which became P two, Oscar Piastri with yet another podium, another really solid drive. Um, I believe yes. this is McLaren's tenth consecutive Grand Prix with a podium. But more importantly, to celebrate Oscar's victory, not the way you wanted it, Emily. This but Zach Brown me. was wearing a orange mohawk wig which was apparently his bet with oscar for winning a race rather than getting a tattoo of the track layout like he has for daniel ricardo and Lando norris i mean that's so oscar to just be like oh zach you don't need to get yourself a tramp stamp just wear this funny mohawk if i win um i get it i don't appreciate it and i don't accept it I think he still I, needs I think I he has set a precedent with Danny and Lando and he just needs tattoo after tattoo until he has no more room. And you know what? He did it to himself and I think it's also great. If you're covered in tattoos, it means you're doing really well. Yeah, exactly. That that's that's what they want. And I also want to point out and we didn't really talk about this because there were so many other things to talk about, but Oscar's victory, obviously there was a lot of like McLaren strategy kerfuffle that was overshadowing a lot of it. Yeah. Um, and people were talking about like Oscar's reaction to his maiden Formula 1 victory, which was very like cool type of deal um and a lot of people are are really comparing oscar to kimi raikkonen the ice man who's a fan favorite driver who's also very much like yeah i'd rather be driving or you know not driving um i'd rather just be you know chilling having a snack and so i think that there are a lot of like comparisons because oscar is just so even keeled and not very good at like no i wouldn't say not very good at expressing emotions but he is not very expressive as some of the other drivers are right i also think i mean this could be way off base but i think maybe too he is a very chill even keel person but I think because Lando was having a bit of a temper tantrum, he was just kind of like, I don't even want to add to this or say oh, anything. Fully. Add fuel to the fire. Like, I just, yes, I won. Thank you very much. I am going home now. You know what I mean? Just trying to, like, yeah. avoid the conflict, the drama, because they are teammates. And I do think it's really big of Lando. He came out this weekend in some of the press sessions 
and said like hey i was acting like an idiot i rained on his parade i overshadowed it that wasn't cool of me he's my teammate you know i it was so unacceptable i hate that i did that which i think is really nice of him to say i'm sure he apologized to oscar privately but it was really good of him to come out and like take one on the chin and be like hey i messed up i shouldn't have done this i was the problem Yeah, no, I mean, it was definitely overshadowed by Lando's behavior after the race, but Lando's behavior came from McLaren and their strategy and and McLaren's decision. So obviously Lando was rightfully upset. Oscar was rightfully like, I don't want to rock the boat. I feel uncomfortable. And he's also like, he's he's still very young. He's the youngest driver on the grid. Um, And, you know, being, you know, running a summer camp, you know, seeing, you know, the younger staff members like trying to do things for the first time and like looking at the older staff members, they're like, but I can't do that. It really, you know, a lot of, you know, what Oscar did with the like, I'm just going to step back and I will celebrate later. Yeah. Um, that that really, that you know, for somebody, you know, being surrounded by all of this at camp right now, like that, that really did stick out to me as well. Um, but I am glad that it's kind of settling because, you know, Oscar deserves to be, you know, excited about this win. Right. And I think it speaks to Oscar's character as well of like, he's only in his second season mm-hmm. in F1 and he really handled that well because I could see some like not rookies but newer drivers to the grid right getting their win and having it being overshadowed and just like going off on the media post race about how you know xyz this isn't fair there's some problems there's issues you know what i mean and i think he he held his head high and and handled that really well yeah, and credit to the, all of the media training that he's gone through that he, you know, that he had to go through, especially in 2022 with everything that happened <laughs> at Alpine and his his exit from Alpine, like all of the media training that these drivers go through is insane. And sometimes it works really well. And sometimes you have Max Verstappen that just says what he wants. But speaking of Max Verstappen, Charles Leclerc inherited pole position from Max Verstappen um, because Max got pulled by a mile, but got a 10 place grid penalty for taking a new internal combustion unit and charles being charles could not convert charles leclerc is the luckiest boy alive he inherited pole and he inherited a podium yeah like nothing he did this weekend personally was exciting it was super forgettable very anonymous and it was like he was awarded things just because other people had penalties or got disqualified. <laughs> yeah, yeah, really, really. Yeah, it, it's very, like, I just, the Ferraris looked a little better, especially in qualifying, but just in the race, they were just completely irrelevant and, and, and yeah. anonymous. They were just kind of there. I know, I'm, I mean, I'm really hoping we, we turn it around a little bit in the second half of the season, but I just don't know if it'll be possible. So. Yeah, no, it'll be it'll be real, real interesting. But going into the summer break, just a little bit of a standings update. Max Verstappen still leads the drivers' championship. He's got two hundred twenty-seven points. Um, he's seventy-eight points ahead of Lando Norris in P two. Charles Leclerc has one hundred and seventy-seven points. He's twenty-two points back of uh, of Lando. Oscar is in P four, ten points back of Charles, and then five points behind Oscar is Carlos Sainz, which is wild to me. Like I. Yeah. Yes. know where where we are like it makes sense but it's wild to me that carlos is still fifth when he had to sit out a, com- a race completely oh yeah and it's it's wild to me that charles is that high up yes yes like it, it max makes sense lando makes sense oscar makes sense but i again charles i just i mean i know he won monaco great good for him but i just i forget that he's been consistently high up in the points and he can be number three still in the standings yeah yeah it it is it's I think he definitely took advantage of a lot of like the early season success that Ferrari did have and he's really banking on that right now um obviously he did get you know a podium's worth of points even though it was p3 but you know Oscar's coming for him there you know there's there's only 10 points between them and then Carlos is you know he's still having some solid races despite some questionable strategies um so it'll be it'll be interesting to see I I think Charles could definitely relocate himself for the down the standings um especially if the performances you know continue to be like this oh i can barring agree. you know today's miracle podium and today's or and yesterday's miracle pole position right the other thing that's wild to me is constructors because mm-hmm. it's, it's red bull mclaren ferrari mercedes which 
Ferrari, I feel like they've done absolutely nothing for the last several races, and they're still like 79 points ahead of Mercedes, which is insane. Like, Mercedes yeah. has had, what, three wins relatively quickly. I mean, I know that they've had some races where they didn't get any points, but they always get those sneaky points. And I, like, to me, it would be Red Bull, McLaren, Mercedes, Ferrari. But yeah, like you said, those early races. Early races, exactly. Yeah. And, you know, Mercedes had a point in, like, the first quarter of the season where there was a, like, the top three were all, you know, way ahead of Mercedes in P4. And Mercedes was a lot closer to Aston Martin, who is a very, very distant fifth. And I, they don't even have 100 points yet. So it is yeah. it is fascinating. You know, McLaren is, is inching their way and Red Bull needs to do something to hold them off because they're only 42 points up right now. And the Ferrari McLaren switch feels like it should have happened a long time ago but really only happened a few races ago right so which is also you know, McLaren wild. is separating themselves from Ferrari right now but Ferrari is still only 21 points back yeah of, and, of McLaren oh man McLaren only being 42 points back from Red Bull they have, to pull Checo. they have to book Checo like that's we'll honestly talk about it in a second we'll talk I know, about, we'll, but we'll get there we'll get there but yes. I know I know I know but just logically thinking of it that's like two races away from McLaren I know I'm you the know, Red Bull fan I know. Red Bull you're like I know okay <laughs> um and we're neutral on the papaya because you know we we love rooting for Oscar and, and Lando um yeah but it's yeah. just it's crazy to me yeah like this is yeah this is we at the beginning of the season, I think we called that McLaren was going to have a, a good season, especially off of oh, all I the fully progress did. they I, made I, I definitely last did. year. But I didn't, I mean, I did not see it being this close already. Oh, no, I didn't, I didn't either. Like, it, it really goes to show you just how bad Checo Perez has been compared, like, even even with like the engineering catch up that, you know, that Red Bull has has seen from the other teams, there's, you know, there's no run support, so to speak, for for Max. It's just Max doing what he can. Um, so it's it's going to get real interesting real quick. But we'll talk about the rest of that in a second. Two quick things for who else impressed. <gasps> All right, number Catherine. One, number one, Esteban Ocon and Pierre Gasly's Deadpool and Wolverine themed race suits. Love. Which we also called as we were recording, but we they did. hadn't come yes. out yet. And then as soon as our episode published, they came out. It's like, of course they did. Immediately. Um, no, I think... Again, whoever did this livery, the whole theme of the weekend, 100 out of 10 points for me. So great. Just goes to show that they do know how to do liveries. They do know how to do race suits. Um, it's so much better than what they have. I'm still waiting for the pink camo. I know we kind of talked about this, but like, yes. I want the pink camo still. I think they can make it happen. Yeah, so to to speak on the, the pink camo a little bit, there was a um, a social, an Instagram post that they that they created where like Akon was like flipping through different options of um liveries of the Alpine car and it showed the blue the blue version in quotes and the pink version in quotes and then it showed the pink camo version that they yeah. teased but it showed what it would look like and then they went to the Deadpool, Deadpool and Wolverine car and I'm like but where's the pink camo livery actually so maybe it's coming in the second half of the season it had better be because that is a good looking car. And honestly, they should just keep the Deadpool and, and Wolverine livery because that car looked really, really good on track. It did. It didn't I, look like an Alpine, but Alpine doesn't really want to look like Alpine right now. So it was fine. Yeah. I'm, I'm so out on Alpine. Honestly, I forget they exist. This is I the only rele relevant thing they've done all season. So yeah, seriously. Um, okay. And then I also want to give an honorable mention for who else impressed to the McLaren mechanic, who's the Jack man for the pit stops, who saved Oscar Piastri's pit stop when he overshot his marks. The way the replay showed him just like taking all of the energy from the car when Oscar stopped late and just holding it in his body to keep the car where it was supposed to be so that they could change the tires. And then the camera cutting back to him and like somebody from the team like being like, are you okay? Do you need to see someone? from the medics because like that those cars are going real fast even hey. in the pit lane and he was like he, he handled it like a champ even though that was not an easy pit stop snaps for you jack man yep 
Okay, can we get into who disappointed now? Yes, let's, <laughs> is, let's do the first this one. This is the meat and potatoes and what I really want to talk about. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. So the first, so Zhou Guanyu had some hydraulic issues. He ended up DNFing. Um, he, I wouldn't necessarily say that he's been disappointing this weekend. I think it's the whole season. Mm-hmm. He's continuously not done well. Granted, the car that he's driving at Sauber right now is, is bad. terrible. It's very bad. We all know it. They know it. But it's really not helping his chances of keeping his seat either with Sauber or finding a new seat for 2025, um, which I think is really disappointing. I There's only so much you can do with a terrible car. Right. Um, but he's consistently qualifying like P18, 19, or 20, and then finishing in P19 or 20. Um, and he just, I personally don't think he's done enough to to no. remain on, on the grid next season. No, it's it's incredibly unfortunate, but it's it's just it's so not what we need. And it's it's not to like fully not to what he's capable of. Because no. he's he's fully capable. He's such a great driver, but he has never been in a car that could deliver him the results that would show just how good he is. And I think you know, you've talked about how much sponsorship money he comes yeah. with from, you know, all those businesses in China who are so happy to have representation on the Formula One grid. Um, and it's in like the many, many millions, but I I just really don't think it's enough i mean haas even came out and said allegedly that the you know they turned down the the sponsorship money from you know joe's backers because they're they're not they said it's not enough it wasn't enough for for them to live to deliver and Ocon, for all that Ocon is not a great teammate has a lot more experience than joe does and has is a proven race winner yeah in a bad car in an alpine yeah Alpine wasn't that bad in the year that he won, but still, like, it was not good. No, I just, it makes me sad because I think it's great. He, again, like Lewis, Joe is so good for the sport and he's so good to have on the grid. And I, you know, he's, seems like such a great guy. It's sad to see him leave, so. But I just. Potentially, probably, yeah. I know we're we're jumping the gun here, but I think it's very, very likely. And, And like Catherine said with Haas. They were like his ability and what he's been showing. It doesn't, the money means nothing. Like we'd rather have a a solid driver. So, and I think he brings like 20 to 25 million with him, which like. It's a lot of money. It's a lot of money. Yeah. Um, And especially for a team like Haas that is. That doesn't have Typically is is having financial issues all the time. That really says something to what they're seeing from him versus what they're seeing from other available drivers. Yeah. And then obviously they went with Akon. Which. Yeah, but I think he's definitely a driver in the hot seat, potentially losing his seat along yeah. with. Yeah, we can finally talk about it. It's time Senior to talk about Checo. Checo. Again. So, yes, again. He actually qualified well. I will give him that. Granted, yeah. he ended up on the front row by default because Max was given his penalty. Still, um, qualifying P3 based on where he had been for the last few weeks in qualifying, that was. It he was like, it was like out almost of like Q1 and well, Q2 yeah. and actually qualified well. Yeah. Cuz we're used to like holding our breath and be like is he even going to get out of Q1 and like yeah. or Q2? He I don't know when the last time it was that he made Q3. But even then it's when is the last time he made something out of his Q3 appearance? Exactly. Which, it's it's been color wars today so I haven't had time to do all this math and and do all all of that looking. But Helmet Marco said though in an interview today that Perez completely collapsed and, and honestly, he's not wrong that's that's the best way to describe what happened today because you don't like you don't go in a Red Bull from P2 to P8 which became P7 after the DQ it just doesn't happen to somebody who is driving a Red Bull car honestly starting P2 he should have won yeah on it and, and I don't think that's unfair for me to say and I don't think that's me expecting too much from him yeah, I he's mean, in that Red Bull car. He started on the front row. He shouldn't be finishing in P eight. No, no, and I mean, maybe it would be you know, it would be a little bit more gener- generous to say that he should have finished on the podium just because of where Red, Red where just right, where the, they are I, right I, I now agree. developmentally. Yes, like yes, if this yes, was yes. if this was like eight weeks ago, then yes, he should have won from P two. But the way that the the cars have caught up, um, I just think that. It's we expected way more than than what we got out of Paris today. But I'm going to ask you this: 
Mm-hmm. If Max started in P2, would you expect him to win? Yes or no? Well, yeah, but that's Max. He's com- I think that he's completely different from Checo. Right, he- but it's the same car and like Checo keeps, well, not this season, but last season, he's like, oh, we're the same. Like there is no number one driver. Like I'm really good. And it's like, where? Exactly. And this season I feel like is almost worse than last season. Last season he actually oh, won fully. races. Yes. But I just I I understand what you're saying Max is a completely different driver, but I also think it's it's very telling and showing when it's like, oh, he's starting P2, but like we would never say that we expect him to win. Let's just say podium because of who he is. You know what I mean? That, that's that's yeah. what he's showing like well, we I, it's, are it's, losing confidence in him. It's, so I it's can't less imagine. About- it's less about where who he is and more about the way that the other cars have developed around Red Bull. That's what I'm saying. Like if this was before the development catch up from McLaren and Mercedes, then obviously, yes, he should have won from P2. But in the situation where Red Bull is right now, where all the teams have caught up with them, you look at Max and Max is doing everything he can. I don't expect that out of Checo with the way that, you know, the cars have outdeveloped the Red Bull right now. Should I be expecting more out of Checo? Echo yes. fully, yeah. but based on the experiences that we've had in every single slump that Paris has endured, that's where I am right now as the Red Bull fan and just looking at, at what we have in front of us, which I think is clear that they need to make a radical change. Right. Because if we are losing confidence in him, I don't know how they don't lose confidence in him. Mm-hmm. I mean, I know he came out and said it was a complete collapse, which is fine, but if they don't do anything about it, then why are they talking about it? Exactly. And, and like Checo came out and he's like, I'm not going to answer any more questions about like anything that's going on, which is fine. And I understand. And uh, let me take this a step back. As the number one, you know, member of the We Don't Like Checo Club, I do feel bad for the current media just onslaught of, oh fully is your seat safe what's going on are you being pulled like that sucks to hear over and over and over and like yes he didn't have a great race but he still finished in the points and instead of people being like hey under the circumstances it was a great race it's automatically like does this mean you lost your seat so that can't be fun to hear we all know he kind of struggles when he's not doing well so we're basically kicking him while he's down Right. I get that and I understand, but I don't think he's doing himself any favors driving the way he's driving. No, no, I agree with you. It's like, you know, last week in Hungary, going from P16 to P7, that was not great, but at least he finished in the points. Right, because he could have started P16 and ended P16, but he made up a ton of ground. And like, that would have been the, the time to be like, hey great race you made up a lot of time but it's hey you finished p7 does this mean that Mm -hmm. you don't have a seat next year yeah but now like this though this is just this is brutal this is this is really brutal and it's it's and it's not even that he you know fell behind you know the mercedes and the mclarens and finished fifth this is he fell behind the mercedes the mclarens his teammate and you know a ferrari so it it really is it's not good we already know that danny ricardo and liam lawson are going to be testing max's car in imola this week we know that red bull is going to be meeting on monday to determine what to do with checo obviously daniel and and liam are their their options for for the backup um we put a poll out on our youtube um community page asking what do you think is you know what do you think is going to do what is going to happen and seven at right now as we record um seven percent people um who voted say that Checo's going to stay and red bull is going to lose the constructors championship to mclaren 91 percent say that Checo is going to be out um ricardo will advance up to red bull and lawson will take his seat at v carb one percent says that Checo is out lawson will leapfrog into the red bull and ricardo will stay with yuki and then the last one um is also just one percent of the vote is that Checo um is out Sonoda goes to Red Bull, which is not going to happen. And then Liam drives with Daniel in um, in the V-carb. Um, but I think that based on just logic and the fact that Daniel has experience in a Red Bull car um, and is a little bit more of a known quantity, I think that we would see Daniel go to Red Bull and Lawson will go to V-carb. You know what I would love to see? Hmm. Daniel moves up after the summer break and then he gets on podium. And oh, and, and well. tears it up. And That's Danny's been honestly, Danny's been qualifying really well in the V carb car, mm-hmm. and I think you put him in a Red Bull, and he automatically gets super competitive. 
Yeah, no, I I fully expect that. I think that the Red Bull and the V Carb are two drastically different cars, which is something that it's it's really hard to quantify that because you you think you look at a, a driver as experienced as Daniel, who's finally back in the Red Bull family, um, and he's not you know performing the way that anybody expected him to perform. But I also think that there's only so far you can go in the V Carb with the way it's you know developed. It's a completely different car. Yeah. Um, for for all that, it's the junior team, so it does kind of make sense that Daniel would struggle. Whereas I do think that he would have less of a struggle if he was actually in the actual Red Bull. Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah. Well, so we'll see. Um, we'll see. Lots of predictions yeah. we're making about Checo, but we need to get into our Belgium predictions as well before we end the episode. So yeah, Catherine and I make very early predictions for the weekend. We pick pole podium and P10. We award ourselves points. Um, so we don't just randomly put guesses down. We actually put thought and a little time, depending on the week. <laughs> depending on the week. <laughs> but for the Belgium Grand Prix for pole, we both had Lando. It ended nope. up being Max slash Charles. Uh, so we both did not get that one. And then podium, I don't think we ever could have guessed this no, in a million fully years. Not. Fully not, regardless of the original or the actual so actual was Lewis, Oscar, Charles, like we said earlier. You had Lando, Oscar, Max. I had Lando, Lewis, Oscar. Um, I yeah. put Oscar in the right place, I guess, but that doesn't you know count for anything. Um, though you do have to thank George, because, or at least you have to thank Mercedes, because George's disqualification from Mercedes' screw-up gave you three points for the P10 pick. Yes, it did. So Daniel Ricardo, who I picked for P10, was elevated from P11 to P10. So we ended up getting a championship point. You had Alex Albon. Um, mm. Mm. Kind of irrelevant. <laughs> yeah. All of Williams, really, except for our man James Valls this season. But yeah, for real. Um, but yeah, so I got three points for getting the P10 pick correctly. So to update you guys on our points totals, Catherine is still in first with 24, but I have come back a little bit and I now have 17. So again, it only takes one weekend for us to kind of get up there and yeah, I'm only up by a touchdown. You you have you have cut the lead. We are we are into a single yes. pos- possession difference now. And then just for fun, Catherine and I try and choose the surprise of the weekend and also who's going to do a dumb. So you said that Checo was going to have a good weekend. I they had um, me going in the first half. And you I made you specify. So you said mm-hmm. P5 finish third row quali minimum he did get the qualifying but not in the race again no. i'd say he had a fine weekend but i wouldn't say he had a good weekend i i don't think i would based on what red bull needed and him being to nice deliver to I, what is going you're on? being real nice but i think based on what red bull needed him to deliver this was not the, it wasn't the day okay. that he wanted it was not the sunday not that he yeah. wanted and I mean, yeah. at least you were a little closer than me. I said that K Mags is going to have a killer weekend after and you nope. know being kicked off of Haas for next season, and it was not Haas's day. No, so I missed on that one. Um, and then for your dumb, you said Fernando and Stroll and, and Lance. Gonna, yeah, we're just going to be full of nonsense, and the Astons were completely irrelevant. Which compared to last season, they are a non-factor. Completely, completely. They, they're All they're season. so in a distant fifth. It's it's not even funny at this point. Yeah. Um, and then I said my my surprise and dumb kind of went together. So I said after Akon made this like big announcement he was moving to Haas, he was gonna have a horrible weekend in DNF. He actually scored points this weekend. So I missed that. But uh yeah. They need a to keep those race be. suits and those liveries. They do. They won't, but they should. But they do. Yeah. And to wrap up, because I feel like we can't go one podcast episode without mentioning this. Carlos Sainz has still not chosen a team or decided where he will be racing. Nope. There have been a lot more rumors swirling again, going back to the whole Williams nonsense that was maybe like a month or so ago when I had finally come to terms with it and accepted it. Yeah. Um, those rumors are really, really starting to get louder, especially over the weekend. Uh, rumors of a one and one at Williams. James Wiles keeps saying like, I want talent. I want, to build this let's go yeah um i think james is really holding out for carlos i just who knows it's yeah Um, honestly i've given up trying to figure out where carlos is going yeah i i want to add and you know who knows what this actually means but carlos senior carlos's dad and carlos's cousin who is also named carlos signs because they're 
all named Carlos. They were both seen in the Williams um, hospitality suite meeting with James Vowles, which I mean, Valtteri Botas has also had meetings with Vowles in the Williams hospitality suite. I, I think Vowles' top two targets right now are Botas and Carlos. Which is um, wild to me because they are leaps and bounds apart from each other. Completely different, but you know, Botas has history at William or at, at Williams and Carlos is Carlos. And, you know, I think that they would kill to have either driver. And it's just a matter of what Carlos decides, I think, will indicate what Botas's season is going to look like. Which Carlos is making this decision, Catherine? <laughs> um, probably senior at this point, because Junior's probably just watching Alcaraz and Nadal play doubles tennis at the Olympics. Or cousin Carlos. Or cousin Carlos. The Carly. You know. I'm not, I'm, the instead Car of the Carloses, it's the Carly. Yes. The Carly three. Yes. That's, I'm coining it. That's how I'm referring to that group now. From <laughs> Amazing. Um, and then to, to clarify something that we talked about um, in our predictions episode, Alpine team principal Bruno Fahman, we, we said that he basically got the Otmar Safnauer treatment where he got fired at Spa. But unlike Otmar, he is staying with the Al within the Alpine family. He's just being reassigned to another division, which feels like a demotion to me, but you know, whatever. But um, it is going to be after the summer break. Um, so it's not as bad as Otmar, but it's still funny that it happened twice. And then in other Alpine related news, that is also unsurprising. They are on the verge of giving up being an engine supplier in Formula One and could become a customer team as early as next year, likely with Mercedes. And that announcement, if it's happening, should be relatively soon. I think, I mean, I think that's a no-brainer, to be completely honest. Like, we all know their their power units aren't as powerful as oh, fully. Mercedes or Ferrari um, or Honda. And this just makes a lot of sense to me i don't know why they haven't done it sooner honestly i get that they yeah. want to like make their own and all that but they have to jump or they yeah, some, some, something's got to give because they're already as as you know they're as competitive as they can be and what they can only hope for is what p8 p9 if they're lucky on a good night a good night a good day yeah no yeah all right well final thoughts again if you're gonna watch one race that isn't monaco of the season it should be spa spa never disappoints it's always my favorite i yeah. don't love that it's a sprint race next year and that's literally oh God, all i could think no. about all weekend but yeah it, i i'm happy ish with the results i'll say i'm not thrilled but i'm also not disappointed i you know, it, it's the the results were were weird obviously it was very exciting after the fact love a little bit of drama love a little bit of intrigue and excitement and like that period of time of waiting for the race stewards to make the announcement which we all knew was inevitable was like that was a really fun period of my day so that you know that that was fun and like to me let's be honest george did drive a really great race um Ugh, and it's just i know it's like Ugh, yes, but also, um, like that's the kind of race that you want to see out of Formula One drivers is like them, to, you know, making the decision and just being flawless about it. Um, and that's what I agree. Did. But yeah, that's that's my that's my thought. Um, I'm excited to see what we're gonna get out of the summer break. Um, I'm excited I'm for so our next excited. Formula One race. So in excited a month. for summer break. Yeah, summer okay. break's going to be great. Um, you know, I'm also excited for Zandvoort when we get to Zandvoort. But until then, um. You we shall owe, see. You owe us a F1 fun fact before we end this episode. So what I is do. your F1 fun fact for us today? Yeah, so um, <laughs> George being disqualified out of the win at the Belgian Grand Prix is kind of not the first time this has ever happened. Um, in 1994, Michael Schumacher was disqualified after the race. Um, in 2008, Lewis Hamilton got a post-race penalty. Um, and... This is the third time, um, but three times for one race circuit. Like that's a lot of disqualifications. Yeah. Yeah. Never forget Coda 2023. <laughs> yeah. Coda 2023 was, was a, was a beast of its own. And obviously they've adjusted the, the sprint format and park for me to fix those things. And we'll see what Coda looks like as a sprint this year. Um, but yeah, like that's interesting. What's, what's in the water at spa that you have three disqualifications in 30 years. Like that's a lot for, and like, and this is like disqualifications from the win. Yeah. That's not like P8. 
Yeah. And it, it's like, I, it, it reminds me of, yes, you know, Coda 2023 when Lewis and, and um, Charles Leclerc were disqualified because their skid plates were were short. Um, but also like Sebastian Vettel in 2022, when he got disqualified um, because they couldn't get a sufficient fuel sample size out of his car. So it's it just very interesting. Gotta love it. Gotta love the inner workings of Formula One. Yeah. Well, up next for us on the Going Off Track podcast, TBD. We are going into the summer break, but we will continue to podcast and give all of our thoughts on everything going on. Hopefully we'll have some seats filled. Hopefully we'll get some answers on some things and we will debate them, talk about them, give our opinions as always. Mm -hmm. And this could potentially be our second emergency episode whenever Red Bull decides or doesn't decide on Checo. So. Yeah, I'm hoping that they, maybe they just make the decision on Tuesday because Tuesday's my day off, so I could record whenever on Tuesday. That would, I don't that think would... it's going to be like in two days. If anything. I also I think don't it's think gonna be so, like, but... It'll be like the hour before the next race, honestly. it's gonna be I, I don't, th- I don't <sighs> think it's going to be that close. I, I think that they will make the decision within this summer break of whether they're going to keep Checo or not. The buzzword of Formula One. We will make a decision soon. Soon. <laughs> and so we will have an episode for you soon. Soon. <laughs> and it'll be on a topic TBD soon. Soon. Exactly. Uh, well, that's all I have. I don't have anything else I want to talk about. What about you, Catherine? Are we good? Um, I think we covered everything. It, it's it's going to be a wild one. And I think the kids have just been released. And I think they're, they're uh, getting ready to come to go to bed. Who let the dogs out? Well, with that, thank you so much, everyone, for going through our first full first half of an season. F1 season uh, with the Going Off Track podcast. Like I just said, we will continue to update you guys throughout the summer break. But that has been our Spa Belgian Grand Prix recap episode. Thanks for going off track with us, guys.